I'm Scott Allen Miller, and welcome to the Camera Cafe. So glad that you could join me again. This on our second episode, I am back with my Nikon DSLRs and I wanna talk about this specific, the Nikon D3500, because last year, and this is 2022, so in 2021, I went out and I purchased this camera, this D3500, as a new, new to me, I bought it used, as is important to me for certain reasons. One is, is the first camera that I really went out and got used. And so it was an important experiment for me to see if I was happy getting a used camera. Um, could I find what I wanted? Would I get a good price? And would I be happy with the end results? Uh, and so that was very important for me. And it was a replacement to my existing DSLR. Uh, but the question would obviously come up is why would I get a DSLR new in 2021, especially given how much I do with videography instead of photography. I do both. Certainly I do photography, but a more blended use camera might make a lot more sense. DSLRs being incredibly bad for video if they support video at all. And so because of that, I really wanted to do this episode and talk about why the D3500 for me in 2021 and why I am still very happy with it in 2022 and why this might be something that makes sense for you or maybe something that does not make sense for you, but that, that kind of decision factor and what brought me there. Now in our last episode, I talked about the single lens reflex camera, what makes something an SLR or a DSLR. And so if you are unfamiliar with single lens reflex, certainly just go back and watch the last episode and we cover that. If you have any questions, feel free to leave questions in the comments below. I am perfectly happy uh, to answer them, but I wanna tell a little bit of my personal history with my cameras. I learned photography in the early 1980s using my father's Canon SLR. This was a 35 millimeter, obviously film camera. They didn't have digital cameras available to the public at that time. And uh, it was an all manual camera. It had a uh, through the lens exposure meter, TTL exposure, which was a very big deal at the time. That was very advanced. Uh, we had a couple different lenses. It was an interchangeable lens SLR. So I learned about interchangeable lenses. I learned about primes. I learned about zooms. I learned how to set my ISO with my film. I learned about different types of film. I learned exposure uh, concepts such as the sensitivity and adjusting aperture and shutter speed to accommodate that. I learned about uh, flash synchronization, all those concepts, all of the basics of photography, both the mechanical components and the composition components, all of that I learned on an SLR. And primarily I used an SLR throughout the 1980s, but it was always my father's camera because I was young. In the early 1990s, when it was time for me to purchase my own camera, to start my own photographic journey, when I purchased my own, I did have a couple cameras before then. I had a point and shoot, which I'll do a uh, video about at some point with the Kodak disc system, which was very interesting. And in the, about 1991, I received an Olympus rangefinder, which was an incredible camera. And I will talk about that in the future as well. But when I went out and bought my own first camera, it was a Nikon N5005 autofocus, auto exposure, traditional film SLR. It was a relatively entry level. Uh, I believe the 8008 was the, the step up. And, and so it was an entry level SLR, but had everything that I needed. And especially in the film days, you didn't worry about having an, a higher level camera to get a better image quality, because it was all dependent on the lens, what you got were features. How quickly could you take multiple uh, exposures? How quick was your autofocus? Things like that. But the actual image quality was determined by the film and the lenses, not by the camera. And so it was, it was very appropriate to have a starter SLR that gave me that, that start into having my lenses, into uh, learning my own craft and having my own gear. 
And part of that was growing up, my father was always a Canon user. And so I kind of forged my own path as one does. and was like, well, I'm not going to have Canon. So I wanted to go Nikon. Uh, and I was a member of the Kodak Camera Club, which was Nikon based. And so I was exposed to Nikon cameras a bit at the camera club. And at the time, Nikon was very much considered the best camera made in the world, uh, within reason that, that, you know, Hasselblad, obviously, uh, like of those things. But for normal cameras that you would get in a normal store, Nikon was considered the best. And it was the photo, photojournalist camera. And I was very interested in photojournalism. And I had been doing competition photojournalism at that time. So I started my journey on a Nikon uh, SLR. When the digital realm came about, it was about 2005, uh, I decided to make the jump into digital photography. I had had some starter digital cameras before then, but always very low quality. They were sort of experimental up to that point. Uh, I still used that same Nikon SLR uh, for about 15 years as my primary camera. And I had a period where I didn't do as much photography and it made me very sad. In about 2005, I decided to venture into digital photography. And of course, because I already had experience with Nikon, because I was so happy with what Nikon did, and I already had F-mount lenses, I decided to go, quite naturally, for another Nikon. And I started with the D50, which was a 6 megapixel CCD sensor. At the time, one of the very earliest Nikon DSLRs. And importantly, it was the very last product that they made that still had the built-in motors that allowed it to turn the pre-DSLR lenses for autofocus. So I could still use my old lenses that I had had for 15 years. Maybe not the best decision to, to stay so legacy, uh, but that's why I did. And I really loved the D50. I fell in love with how easy it was. It made me go out and start taking pictures like never before. I felt free from film that I could just go shoot anything I wanted, anytime that I wanted. And I, I fell in love with photography again because of that camera. It only took a few years because that was a time when development in cameras was happening very quickly. Uh, by 2008, just th about three years later, they had advanced so much. At, at six megapixels, and I'll do some, some discussions about megapixels and, and what really makes sense, and mostly this has become historic because everything is pretty good today. At six megapixels, you were very aware that you did not have enough. You would do things and be like, wow, I can see I'm at the limits of my sensor. And in 2008, I had a baby on the way and decided it was time to upgrade because the sensors were then doing double the megapixels, double the resolution as that D50. And so, and I also decided to move up a layer and go to the semi-pro instead of the consumer uh, or, or prosumer uh, DSLR of the D50. And I decided to move to the D90. And this is my D90 here. I still have my D50 or it's still around, I should say. My father has my D50. It still exists. It still works. There's nothing wrong with it. It still has its original lens kit. Uh, the D90 I got in 2008. And a bunch of my uh, most significant work is with the D90. This is where um, I did all of the pictures of my children as they were growing up. This was my workhorse camera um, for all of my early travel uh, and portraiture photography, um, sports, and all kinds of things I did with the D90. And I absolutely loved this camera. And this was my main workhorse photographic camera for 15 years. That's a really big deal. It's a 12 megapixel CMOS sensor. It does a beautiful job. It's the original XSpeed processor, the original one with the name. Uh, and everything about it is fantastic. And this particular lens, I really only ever used two lenses on the D90, which is, I think, pretty surprising. Uh, I had the 18 to 200 millimeter, uh, which is a 3.5 to 5.6. This is a GED lens, AFS. Uh, and it did a fantastic job. Not the fastest lens, but it was my first lens ever that had uh, vibration reduction, has, which is basically lens stabilization, early lens stabilization. Uh, it has manual um, override. You can, you can just flip a switch right on the lens and go to manual focus, flip it back and go to autofocus. Uh, it's got the really nice zoom with a really good zoom range. So this was my workhorse lens for a really long time. I also have a very fast uh, f1.4 uh, 35 millimeter prime, uh, and which is basically a nifty 50 because this is a DX sensor, the D50 and the D90. I went with DX sensors, which is the APS-C. So that's a 1.5 crop factor versus 
the full frame or 35 millimeter that I was used to with the 5005. But when I was moving to digital photography, I was not working in photography. I had been a professional photographer with my 5005. I'd worked for newspapers. I'd done a number of different uh, professional projects. So I'd been a professional photojournalist and sports photographer in the 1990s. But I was working in IT when I, when I went digital and did not want to overinvest inappropriately. I just wanted to be able to move up and have something that really made me enjoy taking pictures again um, and create memories for the most part. And so the DX or APS-C size sensor was really perfect for me. And, I, and I'm very happy with that decision all along. So I stayed with that when I went to the D90 uh, and, and kept these lenses. Now, just last year in 2021, I finally decided for a couple of reasons uh, I wanted to move up. I mean, obviously at 15 years old, this is an older camera. The sensor at 12 megapixels is a little bit on the low side, but we have to say an iPhone 13 today is still a 12, 12 megapixel sensor and is perfectly good for most things. So 12 megapixels, not really a problem. This is still a completely viable camera 15 years on, does a wonderful job. Uh, it is starting to show its age, but one of the things I have to say is I only ever owned a single battery for this camera. And to this day, I still only have one and it still lasts forever. I can go months of using this camera relatively casually, but it being my workhorse, I can pull it out and just keep going. And that battery never runs down. I take picture after picture after picture. Of course, this is an SLR. There's no video capability on here, or if there is, it is so minor, I'm not aware of it existing. There's no setting for it. I have no idea how you would use it for video. I'm pretty sure there is none. Never even looked into it, never occurred to me to try to use it for video uh, because it has a mirror. And so the, the functionality of the camera makes no sense if you're gonna take video. So because of that, it can take photographs for forever. I, in the years since, needed video capabilities. And so, as you know from many of my channels, obviously I record video on a regular basis. I have many different video cameras, but all of those I am purchasing for their video capabilities, not for their photographic capabilities. Not that they can't take beautiful photographs, whether it's my iPhone, my Olympus EM, EM-1 Mark II, uh, my Olympus Pen, or any number of other cameras. I also have a Lumix that I used very heavily for a number of years. But by 2021, last year, I decided I was really missing having a modern or relatively modern DSLR uh, that was incredibly excellent in image quality and could give me the feeling that this D90 did 15 years ago. And so I did some research and looked and found the updated Nikon series. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this is I wanted this camera to be available for my daughter who is also interested in photography. And I wanted us to be able to go out and take our cameras together and go do projects. Uh, we like to do photo walks together. And if she has her own camera, we're much more able to do that than if she's borrowing mine, then we're having completely different things because I only have so many cameras. So what I wanted to do is stick with the DX sensor, the APS-C, stick with Nikon, be able to share my lenses, uh, but move up quite a bit. And the D3500 is important for a number of reasons. One, it is much smaller than the D90. You, it's hard to probably see in the video, but this is a tiny, not just the lens is smaller, which it is, but the body is much smaller and much lighter. This easily is half the weight. So this was just so much more convenient to use as an everyday photographic tool. Uh, and this is a 24 megapixel sensor. This is a entry level, the D3000 series, 3000, 3100, 3200, 3300, 3400, and 3500 have been the entry level series for a very long time with Nikon since the, the late 2000s. And this represents the very last entry level DSLR that Nikon has made and will ever make. They have now exited the SLR business. And so this is a very special camera that this is the last entry level there will ever be. I was able to find it used for a very good price. I don't think it was a special price. It was, it was just, it's a good price. It's available uh, for about six or $700 brand new and used, I think you can get it for about $400, uh, which is really good for getting into a camera you can absolutely use professionally. They do have a new sensor that replace the 24 megapixel in some of the upper level DX uh, cameras. Uh, they never put it into the entry level one, but it drops to 20 megapixels. 
again, we will have a talk sometime in the future about megapixels and, and resolution and how 24 is actually more than most people need. However, there was an, a noticeable step backwards in the newer sensor. Not that it isn't higher quality and not that Nikon doesn't know what they're doing and, and I'm sure it is better than this sensor, but it's not a 100% improvement. It is a step backwards in some areas for a number of steps forward in others. So it's, it's questionable, questionable how much additional money you wanna spend on that sensor. Uh, but more importantly for me, I'm confident that it is a perfectly good sensor that I would enjoy probably more than this one. That sensor is available in their mirrorless line. This was the top sensor ever made for the DX line that is unique to their SLRs. Everything else I can move into their mirrorless, which is their current Z50, Z30, and uh, ZXC, I believe I have that right, uh, cameras. So that sensor is still available. I don't need to get one of their kind of antique digital SLRs. So for me, this camera represents the end of a journey. This is the last uh, Nikon SLR that I'm ever going to own, or at least the last model that I'm ever going to own, the latest, the most up-to-date. After this, I can't use an SLR anymore, and that makes me a bit sad because I've been connected to the SLR world for so long. I don't, I don't feel that the SLR gives me a better photographic experience. I feel that it is a connection to my past. I like the way that it feels. I enjoy being able to use one. Uh, I like the way that it sounds and clicks in my hands. I had a fire truck go by there. For me, one of the most important things that is uh, a factor to me in my decisions about cameras is, does it not, does it make me able to take really great pictures? Any camera can do that, or almost any camera can do that. You can get a pretty old, antique camera, di digital or film, and take amazing pictures that become art, that express yourself to the world, that tell a story. What matters most to me is, does my camera make me want to go take pictures? Does it encourage me to get out there and go take photographs? Because they say the camera that's most perfect for you I can hear the fire truck coming back. The camera that's perfect for you, the best camera for you, is the one you're going to have when you need to take a picture. And that is true. But on the other flip side of that is the camera that's best for you is also the one that makes you go out and take pictures. It's not just, oh, I was out. Now I'm going to take a picture. That is important. But it's also, I'm going to go out and take pictures today. Or is it making you go out? And I feel that the D3500 does that. It has beautiful image rendering. It's comfortable and fun to use. I enjoy using this camera. It's not my everyday camera. It's not my go-to camera. I will spend long periods of time with it carefully on the shelf. Uh, I have a great lens selection for it, but I don't take it out every day. I'm gonna take it out more. I've made an effort to make it more accessible to myself so that I can spend more time with it. I love holding it in my hand. It makes me happy to hold this camera and I really look forward to using it more. And I'm glad that it continues the legacy of this D90 and its siblings, the D50 and the N5005 that have been such an important part of my photographic journey uh, as an artist, uh, as a photographer, and as the storytelling of my life. These are devices that have been a part of that and will continue to be a part of that. So when you're looking at cameras, there's so many things you need to look at, technical aspects, of course, but also emotional, historical, and creative. Is this a tool that's gonna make you more creative, a tool that's gonna make you more excited, a tool that's gonna make you go out there, a tool that just stores your, st stores, stirs your creative juices and makes you want to do things you weren't gonna do otherwise? That's something to look for in a camera. And for me, this is a device that does that. And I would encourage you to look is this a camera that would be perfect for you for those reasons? Perhaps it is. It's an interesting camera. It has beautiful color rendering. At 24 megapixels, the sensor in this is excellent and unique. It has the Xseed 4 processor, Xspeed 4 processor, excuse me, which does a great job uh, of, of color balance and, and makes it very snappy and easy to use. It has a lot of modern features. It has a great lens selection. They're a little bit pricey in many cases. I am gonna do a video about the lenses that I really like on this specific camera because they are interesting. Uh, and 
I think for a lot of people, and this is something I'm going to cover a lot in this channel because I work in Central America and my availability of cameras, lenses, and camera equipment is very poor. So I have a much more difficult time. I have to get my cameras uh, over a long period of time. I have to plan for them very carefully and I have to worry about what I'm able to maintain and support. And so for me, buying used lower cost camera gear that is more inspiring and more creative and more fun and is going to encourage me to do more exciting things is very important compared to going out and getting the absolute latest models or spending more money. Uh, I can't get things shipped on release day. I can't, I can't realistically go get all the parts I need. If I order a brand new camera and it ends up it needs something I don't have, I can't go get that. I have to order that and maybe take months or half a year before I can go pick it up. So having stuff that I can test remotely, have ready for me and make it very affordable is very important. So for me, used cameras uh, that are very exciting um, are important. That doesn't mean really old cameras. This is still the current model. You can still buy this from Nikon today that I've owned it for a year and got it used on a really good deal. Uh, it shows just how easy today it is to get used cameras that are really good. And it's worth noting that we've entered an era of digital photography where there are now generations of antique digital cameras that are absolutely excellent with great image quality, interesting features, can be fun to use and do something kind of unique. Just like in the film days, we had decades in which you could go back to very old cameras, and as long as you're using new film, you could get amazing results using old cameras or even vintage lenses. We're starting to enter that same era with digital photography. Of course, if you want the highest megapixels, the absolute latest features, the fastest autofocus, yes, you need the newest cameras. But you don't need that in many cases. For most of us, we're doing things that we could use a much older camera. And so while this is the D3500, you could easily go to many older models. And in fact, all the way back to the D3200, you have the same sensor. You may not have as fast of a processor, so you may lose a few features. You may not have the video features. There are some video features in here. Who cares? I don't know. Uh, but you could go back and get the D3200 for much cheaper and still have an amazing camera with this same sensor. Go back to the 3100, you'll drop the price a lot. You still have a 14 megapixel sensor. It's larger than an iPhone would have today. It has that big APS-C sensor in there so you get that, that, that shallow depth of field. You have lots of big glass you can get for these things. And if you go back further yet, yes, you're gonna drop in price even further and you may be looking at CCD sensors or you may be looking at the 12 megapixel or lower, the 10, the eights, the sixes. I wouldn't go much low, lower than four. You're gonna get it into even on Instagram. It's gonna be a problem uh, posting those pictures, but within reason, you can go quite far back and get cameras that are fun to use, very affordable. And maybe by having a lower cost camera that's so quirky, Maybe it makes you want to run out and use it because why not? Don't worry about what's going to happen to the camera. It costs you $50, right? Now, this was a lot more than 50 and this is something I'm going to treasure, but it's an important creative tool for me that makes me happy. And happiness makes me creative. Being creative makes me go out and take pictures. And I hope that this video encourages you to think about your tools and what's going to make you get out and take pictures and maybe reconsider spending money or lots of money as your goal, as the thing that you're going to do, and maybe say, oh, you know, there is a camera that's so much less expensive, or a, a, some tool that is so much less expensive that's gonna make me really happy and creative, and I'm gonna go out and do something amazing. Or maybe if you've never used an SLR, it's time to investigate whether one would be fun for you. And if you've never used the Nikon series, I highly encourage you to give it a look. I use lots of different cameras, and I'm gonna talk about a lot of different cameras but I have always had this very special personal connection to the Nikon SLR series, and I wanted to share that with you guys over a cup of coffee. So thank you for joining me here at the Camera Cafe. I'll see all of you next time.